Hi everyone and welcome to the Aurora Health Alliance Race as a Social Determinant of Health webinar. Uh, thank you for taking your lunch hour to be with us. I wanted to start off um, by reading the statement about Black Lives Matter that we sent out last week. Aurora Health Alliance stands in solidarity with Black members of our community. Black Lives Matter. We cannot be silent about the systemic and institutional racism that is pervasive in our world. At AHA, our mission is to work collaboratively to improve access to healthcare and create a healthier Aurora with a focus on the most vulnerable and underserved. We'll prioritize including the needs and voices of Black people, Indigenous people, and all people of color in our activities going forward. AHA is committed to change, and that includes addressing the health inequities tied to racism. Thank you for joining us, um, during, especially during this time of unrest and change and during the week of Juneteenth. We are very lucky to have an excellent panel, um, and they are definitely the experts here. They'll be leading the narrator, narrative, and I'll be serving um, as the moderator here. So our panel includes Foster Expose Jr., PhD, um, Maisha Fields, Renee Gonzalez, and the MBA PhD, and Omar Montgomery. I'm sure several of these names are familiar to you. So we'll start with um, the panelists giving a brief overview of themselves and um, we'll, they'll touch on today's racial climate and opportunity for change. Then we have a couple of guided questions um, that I'll ask the panel and then we'll open up uh, questions from the audience. If you do have any questions, please um, put those in the chat or let us know if you have a question and, and would prefer to ask it on video. This uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel next week probably. Okay, so we'll start with um, Foster. Sure. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, Foster Exposé Jr., I am the manager of Physician Leadership Development with UC Health Medical Group. I am new to my time here. I'm an implant from Houston, Texas. So I've got about six months into my time here at, in the Denver metro area. Um, I'm pretty passionate about what is happening right now across the country. And from my perspective, I think it's the perfect time for us to learn something. What's been working before is not working any longer. And for us as individuals, as humans, to move past this, we have to learn something. But the challenge is, what do we do with what we learn? So I'm, I'm thankful to be here for the, um, the panel. And thank you so much, Mandy, for uh, allowing me to, to sit on the panel. Thanks, Foster. Maisha? Maisha, oh, there you go. are you there? If, if you are, you're on mute. Um, while Maisha gets situated, um, Renee, can you go next? Sure. Um, thank you, Mandy. And thank everyone who's joined uh, the Zoom meeting during the lunch hour. I also want to thank you, thank our, our colleagues on this panel. Very honored to, to sit next to him and, and as a member of the Latino, Latina, Latinx community, just want to show my solidarity and support in this, in this movement against uh, social injustice and racial injustice. So I think from, can everybody hear me okay? Sorry, I was speaking a little lower. Okay, thank you. So my name is uh, Rene Gonzalez. I'm the Senior Community Engagement Liaison with Colorado Access. Uh, we service the state's Medicaid population or Health First Colorado members for Adams, Arapaho, Denver, Douglas, and Albert counties. Um, we do a lot of um, work in this space and I'm fortunate to be part of this social determinants of health work. 
uh, specifically on um, a couple programs, uh, the Program Improvement Advisory Council and the Member Advisory uh, Council. And we actually fill those spots with, with different community members, Health First Colorado members and our health system partners. Uh, we do a lot of great work with um, our health systems partners as well. And I also do, I also have a, a really unique and role as a statewide health a statewide health equity commissioner for Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. So there's a lot of roles um, I like to play in this space. And I, and I again, I thank Mandy for having me part of this group. Um, in terms of your second question, Mandy, um, so the racial climate and the opportunity for change, um, there is obviously significant momentum right now. And I don't think, um, I don't think we should or try to move away from this momentum. You know, we live in a microwave society, right? Where we want information instantly, we get information instantly, and it's a good thing. At the same time, it's a double-edged sword, right? Uh, we have news cycles that are super quick, right? Um, and I feel like these news cycles follow the shiny new toy and this isn't one this is an this is an opportunity to push forward um this level of inclusive uh, work right and so I, I think momentum should go obviously i think the next wave is going to be the election cycle right and so after that we need to keep this momentum going um and and make sure we hold a lot of these legislators that are going to perhaps use this platform, right, to get elected, but we need to continue this momentum moving forward. It cannot stop. Uh, we, we, we have to really work together to, to keep this forward. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you so much. Um, Aisha, I see that you've joined. I saw you for a second. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I was having difficulty with my sound. And I just want to say thank you to our, um, our executive director for Aurora Health Access um, and all the board members for Aurora Health Access putting together this panel and making sure that we have this um, very important conversation about social determinants of health, but also what our collective responsibility is in decreasing inequities that are present uh, in our institutions. My name is Maisha Fields. I am the executive director of the Fields Foundation, the Dayton Street Opportunity Center, and one of the founders of the Dawn Clinic. And I'm also, got so much going on, um, the uh, director of the Aurora Community Partnership for Salud. And we are a new clinic, uh, new to Aurora, but not new to um, advocacy and organizing and providing care for migrant farm workers. Um, we are the third largest federally qualified health care center in the state of Colorado. And we were founded out of the mission of providing care for migrant, migrant farm workers, specifically migrant farm workers who were exposed to pesticides and even potentially TB while they were working. Um, and providing food for Colorado and in, in, in the entire nation. And we've recently opened up a new clinic site right off of um, Sable and Six, and our address is 562 Sable Boulevard. And so I'm excited to be a part of this call um, because I have been a part of the lifelong journey as a nurse practitioner, as a clinician, and also as a researcher uh, through the School of Medicine and identifying how race really does have a, a strong uh, role to play as it relates to health care, housing, and economic opportunities. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Omar? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omar Montgomery. I am the president of the Aurora branch of the NAACP, as well as director of Black Student Services at the University of Colorado Denver, and an adjunct instructor in the political science department, as well as the ethnic studies department. I want to thank um, Aurora Health Access for putting this together. Um, I think this is a timely discussion. And I think uh, our people in the healthcare field are, has a very strong voice when it comes to social justice, 
when it comes to um, issues related to race, privilege, and how do we address um, inequities, whether if it's environmental or whether if it's economic injustice and things of this nature. Why is your voice important? Because the very first thing that people think about when it comes to healthcare, how much is it gonna cost? Do I have access to it? Um, will I be treated fairly based on the color of my skin, based on my accent, based on my sexual orientation and things of this nature? I think we've come a long way. I still think we have a long way to go. And the Aurora branch of the NAACP is here, not just for this particular forum, but any other way we can support the efforts that's being done by Aurora Health Access. And thank you for having me here today. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna stop my screen share here. Okay, so our first question is, can you help us make the connection between race and a social determinant of health, especially in Aurora? In other words, what does race as a social determinant of health look like in Aurora? Um, can we start with Maisha, please? Thank you, Mandy, for the question. So it's interesting that um, you raise that question because for so long, we've heard that the greatest determinant of health is your zip code. And so I know that many of you are familiar with that statistic, that where you live determines your health care. And I think that has some very strong similarities with what we see in Aurora. Uh, in Aurora, we know that there are well over 230 different languages. We know also that we are the third largest city in the entire United States for resettlement of refugees and immigrants. And it's important to recognize that immigrants do not just include um, people who are coming from South America, but also people who are coming from Africa and Asia. Um, and that's why we, we, we are so rich in diversity as it relates to our immigrant population and also those folks who have crossed the border looking for greater opportunity for their families. Um, and unfortunately got here, made it on these shores, but don't have the documentation um, and oftentimes find themselves being put in harm's way for just coming to find a better way of life, uh, which is how America was started, as we all know. But Aurora represents that population. Um, the last thing, look, there's, there's two other populations that represent Aurora that determine health and outcomes as it relates to health, education, and economic opportunities. And that would also include native-born Latinos and native-born Black people. So individuals who have been living in Colorado uh, for generations, first, second, and third generations um, as well. That is the population that makes up Aurora. Um, the last thing that's so precious to Aurora is children. Uh, Aurora has the, the second largest population of children, uh, which also means that we have the largest population of single mothers raising children. And that's really significant um, because although we've talked about um, your zip code being the, the greatest determinant of factor. If you think about who's living in those zip codes, we're talking about a microcosm of people of color who have been denied their inalienable right and access to freedom, civil li liberties, education, employment opportunities, and yes, in fact, even health care. And that's why Aurora Health Access was even founded. When Aurora Health Access was founded and me as a founding member, we recognized that at that time, 36% of the people living in Aurora were uninsured. They had no access to health care. And now when you fast forward 15 odd years or more later, and we look at who are the greatest people who have been victims of COVID, it, it was those people who were late to be insured by the Obamacare who were late to have access to primary care, to get checkups on their, on their diabetes, on heart failure, on um, asthma or respiratory conditions. So when we talk about race, it's important to know, unfortunately, that black people, and black people make up the greatest percentage 
of those people in Aurora who have the worst determinants of health. And if you look at determinants of health of uh, immigrants, um, it's, it's much better. But native-born Black people in Aurora have the worst determinants of health in the entire state of Colorado. And that's important as you think about well-being and your trajectory for your own children to graduate from high school, for your children to not become victims of gun violence, community violence at the, at the hands of another person in your community, or gun violence at the hands of a police officer. Uh, black women in Aurora are mo more likely to die from speak from um, from uh, maternal outcomes, um, or not to be able to leave the hospital with their babies after they give birth. And so, I think the most important thing that I would like to say is that yes, absolutely, your zip code determines your outcome. But what we know is that if we lift up the health and the well-being of black people who fall at the bottom of every single well-being threshold and marker that's measurable, if we lift up women who are black and black men and black children, it lifts the entire zip code up as well. Um, and so, you know, that is what I, that's why I think race. Um, is a significant factor in social determinants of health. And the last thing I would like to say is um, Black people, people of color, people living in the zip code of 811, 12, 13, 815, they are resourceful. They are resilient. Um, we are uh, powerful beings who recognize that we may be living with less than and we may have been living on a trajectory where black lives may have not mattered to everyone else, but they've always mattered to us. Our children have always mattered. Our, our children's education has always mattered. Um, but it's the system of structural racism that have kept us far too long behind the curve. Thank you. Um, Renee, what, can you make, uh, connection between race and social determinant of health, especially in Aurora, from your perspective? Yes, and thank you, Maisha. Um, I'm gonna have to follow that um, great introduction. So um, thanks, Maisha, for, for setting the bar super high. Um, so I, I, moved, uh, I moved from, I have a dual citizenship. Um, my family immigrated from Mexico. Mexico. And I grew up in Greeley and in the migrant community, working in the fields. And when I took on this role with Colorado Access, I had an opportunity to move to the Denver metro area and I moved to Aurora. Um, primarily because I didn't know, I'm, st I'm still just a country boy and I didn't know what was going on. And I knew Aurora is where our headquarter office is. And I started learning the great diversity that 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 is Aurora, right? And I have a very, very unique perspective, but I also want to follow up with Maisha in terms of zip code data, right? So I did some research um, for my time here in Aurora and race does have a significant contribution to health disparities, right? So I, so I, I went to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. They have a really cool interactive health equity map. And I took two zip codes, they actually track disparities by census tracts. So they don't really give zip codes. So I kind of identified some popular landmarks, right? So I took Aurora 80011 and Hinkley High School, right? So I circled that area and I looked at non-clinical factors or social determinants of, uh, of health factors, right? And then I compared 80016. So the neighboring high school there is Regis Jesuit, right? A private school. So they're 12 miles apart along the same road. You take South Chambers, right? And you hit Hinkley and then you go up South and you get Regis. It's interesting because I looked at the demographics and a very eye-opening social determinant or health equity measure is life expectancy. Why are people living longer in certain parts of our neighborhoods, right? In Aurora, North versus South. So for the 8001 
one address, um, Hinkley High School area, the Hispanic Latino community is 39%. The African American community is 23%. Now you compare that to South Aurora, the Regis Jesuit community, the Hispanic Latino community are 2.5% and the African American community is 2.8%. Now a very interesting and obviously very different in terms of race and ethnicity numbers. The biggest eye-opening number is life expectancy. So this is census tract data from 2010 to 2015. You can see that life expectancy in zip code 80011 is 80 years old. Life expectancy in 80016 South Aurora is 85 years old, 85 years. So there between 12 miles, there is five year difference. And you can see the makeup of ethnic and racial differences, right, between neighborhoods. So you can, there's a lot of things you can dig into the data. There's, there's, there's not one particular social factor, right? Maisha mentioned several. There's a lot of things where people live, um, access to open parks, access to sidewalks, access to, to food, right? Are people walking to their grocery stores? Do they have to drive? And this is really where race is important because for our Hispanic Latino community or those who are undocumented, they have a fear of driving and getting into their cars and going somewhere. So it can be going to a medical appointment. They're going to be hesitant if they don't have to go or if they have a risk based on their race to go to a particular appointment or go take their kids to school. They have a higher risk of, of, of being separated from their families. And that's a huge health stressor, right? For, for and, and we're not talking about, there's also racial profiling, right? That's also a thing that exists for a lot of our communities of color. So race takes, is, is, a, is very important, is very impactful when it comes to racial or health, health inequity and health disparities. I think going back to kind of, to Maisha's point, to my point in terms of zip code data, you know, there isn't one social factor, right? It's not primarily food insecurity. It's not transportation. There's a lot of factors that combine everything or, or make things more complex, right? It's not just one specific area that, that our community needs help in. So trying to figure out what that is, is what we need to do, right? This is where the data comes in. This is where um, not only like quantitative data, but qualitative data. What are we hearing? What are we listening to? And so understanding that race and by these numbers just show the types of disparities that exist in Aurora between two, two specific areas that I took in this particular example. So you can see how, how race makes a huge impact in the lives of, of, of our community. Thank you so much for that example. It really highlights um, the differences zip codes can make for sure. Um, Omar? I want to jump in on some of that subject, subjective data, more so than the quantitative data, qualitative, uh, more of a qualitative analysis, analysis than a quantitative analysis. Um, and I'll just share a quick story. <clears throat> so anybody familiar with the show, some of you may know this show called Good Times that used to come on. For those of you that got gray and some of you that's been around for a while, used to watch a show called Good Times. Good Times came on from 1974 to 1980. There was an episode where the father, James, had just recently had some dental work done to his son and his wife needed surgery. His major concern was how much would everything cost? We already stand in a housing project. I am the only one really working. The other kids are trying to chip in. I'm trying to save up for them to go to college. I'm trying to do all these things to take care of my family. My wife needs the surgery, but I'm worried about how much it's going to cost. If you follow the episode, he is tracking every single thing that takes place. How much an aspirin costs? How much is a bottle of clinics? How much is it going to take to get this shot? What bed should she be in? That was in 1974. We are in 2020 still talking about the same barriers that keep people of color and many those that are economically deprived from going to seek health care. We're still talking about those things today. 
So let's bring it up to COVID. I went to, I received a phone call from one of the local healthcare places saying, hey, we want to partner with the NAACP. And I want to let you know that there's free testing for COVID. Great. I said, let me go test this out first before I send out a newsletter to make sure this is correct. So I go to one of the places where they're doing the free testing. What they said was, since we don't know if the symptoms are 100% COVID, you would have to pay $90 to have the flu shot and all these other things done before we can rule that it's COVID and that the services is free. Who the hell has $90 when you've been off work for two weeks? Who has this? Who has these financial resources? Excuse my language, I get a little passionate, but I'm still angry that from 1974 to 2020, we're still talking about the same issues when it comes to economic injustice that begins to um, that begins to go in health disparities where I can't have basic dental work done, where kids are being put in special ed because they can't go to the optometrist, uh, not because they can't do the work, it's because they can't see the work. So we have to begin to look at some of these quantitative issues, begin to do our research and talk to these families and find out what is needed in, eight zero and, 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 and the Northwest Aurora area code. By the way, you don't have to go very far. If you go from Havana, and go all the way up west of Dayton, there are people that are homeless, that are in wheelchairs, that that's afraid to go to the doctor because they don't know how much it's gonna cost. Some of them qualify for the services at the Dayton Opportunity Center, they don't turn away, but they don't have enough resources to service all those people right there. So we have to begin to look at taking the healthcare out of the, um, the, the palace of where we're at and bringing it to the streets so that we can begin to serve people free at cost. So then that can drive our economics in the city because people will be able to work, people will be able to provide for their families, and you'll see a trickle down effect of positive things that can happen if we begin to address healthcare inequities. Thank you. Omar, you have a way of firing me up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, last on this question is Foster. I'm almost kind of scared to respond after all of the, <laughs> the great knowledge that came before me. You got this. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm new to the area, so I'm going to speak very generic. You know, as I, as I mentioned briefly in my opening narrative, that this is a time for us to learn something new. And learning something new is that we need to think about how we often say life begins in the womb. And it does. But then we value it more then. But once that life gets here in physical form, we devalue it. We need to think about how we are defining humanness because everyone defines humanness differently across the board. So if we look at how we can define that the same from every ethnicity, every gender, every culture, every creed here in this country, we can start to bridge that gap between the social disparities because we see each other as the same. So I want to add to that. Thank you. Okay, our second question is, what can we as, and I'll, I'll provide a clarifying statement. We've heard people say Aurora Health Alliance, Aurora Health Access. We were, when we were founded, our name was Aurora Health Access. We've since changed our name um, to kind of match uh, what other organizations that are similar to us um, in the state have. So what can we as Aurora Health Alliance and as engaged members of this community do as a next step? I'm talking within our organizations, as organizations and individually. Um, for this one, Omar, can you start? I think I could pick up exactly where I left off with the previous comments. Um, Aurora Central has a pretty good model where they have health care services right there on the campus. It was a pilot program, I think that started a couple of years ago. And they, they not only service the students, but families that come in as well. I think that should be standard for every single school in the city of Aurora, whether if it's in Cherry Creek or whether if it's in Aurora. I think that's something we can advocate for. I think if 
families know there's a place where they can go and address their health care concerns, even if they just find out what is wrong with them. So they can begin to set up maybe a home triage or something like that, where they can begin to address their issues. It's so important. Um, if a kid is going to school and they have a toothache and they have no access to dental care, but they can go to this place on campus, find out what's wrong and get treated. Now that kid can focus on algebra, that kid can focus on chemistry, that kid can begin to think about their future. But if that tooth get infected and have long-term health ramifications, now this kid is more so dealing with their health instead of their education. So we have to begin to figure out how can we, be, how can we become more proactive in distributing services in our most needed areas, but at the same time, not to exclude areas Although they may have that area code that show they have a longer expectancy and things of this nature, I guarantee you there are still people there living paycheck to paycheck that could use those services as well. So I think that is one way we could begin to um, address some of the health equity inequities is starting with our schools, partnering with our school districts, and also having mo additional mobile units on Colfax for our unhoused population, as well as our populations that's been recently incarcerated right there with working with the Second Chance Center or working with Providence at the Heights or working with the Ready to Work program right there on 225 in Parker. We have an excellent infrastructure in the city of Aurora that I think that's addressing other inequities. Now, if we can get the healthcare community to come along, then I think we can have the perfect formula and the perfect situation to begin to turn the tide so people have trust in our healthcare. We gotta talk about that as well. There's a lot of people of color that, want, that don't wanna go and be an experiment like the Tuskegee um, experiments that took place. People still have that in the back of their minds. They wanna know that they're gonna be treated as equals. They're gonna get top-notch healthcare and that when they walk out, they're respected for who they are so that they feel free to come back and not just have a one-time thing saying, I didn't have a good experience. This doctor talked down to me. This doctor treated me like I was nobody. Treat everyone the same and let everyone know their value and provide the service and I think we could turn things around. Always like, thank you. It's always a case in Zoom with, oh, how do I unmute myself? Doesn't matter how many times you do it. <laughs> thank you. Um, Foster? So, at my job at UC Health, I have the wonderful opportunity to develop physicians into leaders. I've been in healthcare now for six years and as a psychologist and executive coach, I have provided 12 physician leadership programs from across this country. And a lot of those leaders have gone on to become uh, medical directors, uh, chief medical officers, and even academic chairs. I truly believe that it starts with education. We need more physicians of color at those leadership tables, having those conversations. But to get us there, we need to, AHA needs to take a reach back and start with the kids, elementary. Having healthcare summits about what are the careers in healthcare that you can go after, from being nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, radiologists. So they get that, that information at an early age, around like four, fourth grade or fifth grade, something like that. And then, getting them interest, interested in healthcare and to becoming uh, physicians and practitioners and, and providers. And as we get into the later group, looking at those, those, uh, those chief residents as they're in their trainings, providing them with leadership development right then and getting more physicians of color and providers of color, again, to sit at those specific tables when we have conversations around quality of care, around budgets, where we put our dollars we put our energy in the community. We have physicians of color and providers of color at those tables to have those intimate conversations so we can begin to, to bridge this gap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Renee, your thoughts? Thank you, Mandy. So a few thoughts. I, I think Foster and Omar touched on it. Education is key. I, I worked and, and co-founded a a dual immersion Title I school, um, prior to my role here at Colorado Access, where Title I basically meaning the majority of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch 
or 90% or above of our students call for a free and reduced lunch. And so getting them a head start, right? We dealt with students that were impacted by homelessness, impacted by food insecurity. These, these barriers obviously impact larger outcomes. We know that a high school diploma equals better health outcomes looking forward and so forth. I think having health tracks with local hospital systems I mean, come on, Aurora has brick and mortar house systems in their backyards, the largest set of house systems in our own backyard, right? And so how can we partner with them, with our community agencies? Um, I think there's a campus to community partnership that exists currently. I mean, if we leverage and scale that particular program, but we need not one system, not one organization, not one health system is gonna make a change, right? We all need to kind of work together to identify what we can do to make the, the largest impact, right? So finding these mutually beneficial goals. But getting the data is also very important. Like I said before, quantitative and qualitative. We need to know and listen to what people are saying. And so it sounds like the community campus partnership, I just read a, a chat that's been defunded, which is an unfortunate process. So. But it's, it's programs like that, it's, it's, we need to really partner with these large systems, find out what their goals are, find out what our goals are and work together to, to accomplish those goals, right? I think from our perspective, and I'm putting my Colorado Access hat on, we have what we call a program improvement advisory committee. And so we invite Health First Colorado members or members with lived experiences. We invite health systems, we invite community organizations to come and advise us on our health plan, right? How nice would it be for us to, to talk to our insurance provider, be at the table with them and say, hey, I don't really like this part of my insurance company or plan, right? We don't have that access, but um, us as, a, as Colorado Access, we have an opportunity um, to Mandy's question, to engage members of our community and help us inform the work we're doing. Our member advisory council, this is comprised here at Colorado Access, full of members, completely of members that are on Health First Colorado. They approve all communication that goes out. We present information to our members and they, they give us a stamp of approval to go out to nearly half a million of our members in the Denver Aurora metro area. So there's a lot of opportunities where we would like to engage with our community partners. So those who are listening today, if, if you have that interest, please let me know, please contact me. We're always looking for members, shameless plug, but we're always looking for members to inform our work as a Medicaid Health First Colorado provider in this community. So I welcome all that feedback. Kind of the last piece is COVID, um, has created some new norms, right? Um, it's, it's, it's something that I think it's gonna, it's kind of has a silver lining, if you will. I mentioned this early on in my introductory point is the resistance of individuals to go to, to travel to a doctor's appointment, for example, for fear of being pulled over or even possibly separated with their families. I think we have seen a spike in telehealth appointments. We have also seen a huge decline in show no-show rates. So people are, are, are joining our calls with our providers because of this telehealth technology. So I think if we leverage and understand these new norms or what's worked during this time and continue to move forward to help our communities, I think that's something that we need to take on and kind of scale at a large uh, moving forward um, after COVID or post-COVID. Thanks, Renee. I, I did want to say related to telehealth, um, Aurora Health Alliance in August is going to be ho hosting a three-part series focusing on telehealth, in particular uh, e-consults and advocating for Medicaid reimbursement um, post-COVID for that. So stay tuned. Okay, and then last for this uh, question on how we can be engaged in this area, Maisha. Maisha, I think you're on mute, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep. Is that better? Yep, okay, thank great. you. 
in light of the conversation around uh, social determinants of, of health and race and how we can be involved, I think the first and most important thing is that we listen. And um, I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been a nurse practitioner for 18 years. My brother was murdered in Aurora. And when he was murdered and his fiance were murdered, not one elected official called us back. I want to say that again. Not one elected official called us back and said, how can I help? What do you need? How can I lead on this issue? And so I think the first thing that people need to do is recognize that the Black Lives Matter movement didn't begin with Gregory Floyd, Breonna Taylor, or, uh, or Amar Aubrey. It didn't begin with Trayvon Martin. It didn't begin with my own brother, Javad Marshall Field, whose case was never prosecuted by the police until we forced them to do it. It didn't begin with the assassination of Martin Luther King or the death of Crispus Atticus. Um, the things that have been occurring as it relates to making sure that Black lives are significant If we look back in time, whether it was Sojourner Truth who said, I am a woman, or during the early 60s when you saw black protesters saying, I am a man. We are a part of a movement that has been reawakened to the rest of the community, to the long time struggle of inequities that black people and brown people and poor people really this is a poor people's movement and black people are always the poorest on the scale, have been embarked on for a long time. So I'd like for everyone to ask yourself, when was the last time you asked your black friend, your Latino friend over for dinner? Because when we think about the movement, it's not just about marching for black lives, but it's about how we integrate Black people into our community, into our way of life, into our lived experience. And when we talk about gentrification and we move away from people of color, what does that mean? So with that, I think it's important that um, I would like to just take some time to give 30 seconds of silence to Black people who have lost their lives to gun violence. Is that okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. you lead. Yep, you lead. Okay. So if we could just do 30 seconds. We all know that it was eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I don't know how many of you have, oh, have, have actually that. had to kneel that long. But I would encourage everyone to do exercise on your own. Um, but let's just do 30 seconds because I think the first thing is important to listen and then to recognize. So let's just do 30 seconds of silence for all the victims who have died because their lives weren't valued. You want to say? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you, Maisha. That was that's powerful. Well, thank you. So I think I want to just thank everybody for taking the time to do that. And then I would also like to just encourage everyone to do that before you step into a meeting. The question was is how do you show up? 
When you show up in a meeting and you look around and there's no other person of color at the table, you should say, how can I extend the table? How do we destroy the table? Or how do we extend the table? For far too long, when people have not been at the table, they've been on the menu. And so we've seen that institutionally, structurally within our system. If we talk about Colorado access, we could look at your Medicaid data and we could see how black people, how poor people, um, how Latinos, how they have the highest rate of poor outcomes for heart failure, for asthma. 86% of the people, and I don't know if I'm correct on this, but this was data that I got back from Colorado Health Institute, but before COVID, 86% of the people across the state of Colorado who were on ventilators were people of color. That was a disparity that has always existed. And so if we want change, we absolutely have to work with Colorado Access. And we have to demand better outcomes for our babies, for our children who, who spend 80% of their time in school but don't have access to, to a pulmonologist but their Medicaid patient and they end up in the ICU in the children's hospital, unable to breathe, and moms unable to go to work. If we believe in Black Lives Matter in this moment, then we have to make sure that people have access to pay We have to make sure we open up our early childhood education centers so that my baby Zion, my king here, could go back to school. <laughs> Um, and this is, and, and you know, and, and this is what, and I have access, I have privilege, I, you know, and so the other thing I want to, I want to make note of is as it relates to our criminal justice system um, and race being a social determinant of health. If we want to make sure that our kids are not a part of the school to prison pipeline, we ourselves, just like I asked everyone, when was the last time you invited someone over to your home from another color, another race, different income, economic disposition? When was the last time you showed up for a child who was about to be expelled for school? Whether it was a pre whether it was a black girl who was three year three years old about to be expelled from preschool or a fifteen year old at Central High School. How are we working together to make sure our kids have the access to resources, food, um, cannabis? Those are like, that's like the first level. That's low-hanging fruit. Um, Mommy, if race is really a social, race is a social determinant of health, and what people are really missing is advocacy. People who have access to power, to change procedures, that are in, in structural racism, that are embedded in systems and procedures that purposely devalue black lives. And so I'm so grateful to be on the call with Colorado Access. And I challenge everyone on this call to look internally. How can you lend greater voice to black people? How can you lend greater voice to black children? How can you listen to greater voice to black teachers? Because we know when black teachers are in the classroom, 95%, they're 95% more likely to go on to college and go on to a successful career and achieve economic security. So how do you lend your voice? How, do you, how are you, are you comfortable with lending your voice? Are you comfortable with talking about race? Are you comfortable with dealing with your own bias and privilege? That is the work of today. I stand in solidarity, and so does I think everyone on this call that Black Lives Matter, but how do we show up each and every day? And when you can't show up and you don't have the time, because I think we all recognize that it's a matter of how we balance all of this, support your local organization. Support the NAACP. Support the Urban League. Support the Colorado Defense Fund. Support the ACLU. Support Aurora Health Access. And make sure that if you can't show up to the Capitol, if you can't call your legislator, if you can't call your policy administrator at the University of Colorado, 
who's denied access for people of color to be admitted into the program to become doctors, nurses, dentists, then they can do it on your behalf because we are more powerful together than apart. Thank you, Marisha. If anyone has any questions for the panel, um, we have 10 minutes or so left. Um, drop them in the chat and Joanna has been monitoring that. So Joe, is there anything to highlight? Yeah, um, we had, um, yeah, we have a few minutes left. Brad Williams um, had a few questions. I'll pick one of the first one. Um, what's already in place and working that we can build upon? And I know Renee, you mentioned the uh, Program Improvement Advisory Committee and other committees that are happening, um, but this is open to all the speakers. What, what's already in place and working that we can build upon? Um, and what's a number, a number one issue to tackle? So that's a couple of questions from Brad. Omar, do you want to start? Um, Not everyone has to answer. I'll just call you out if, if no one's jumping. I think I've seen some pretty good things that are taking place, like the model at Aurora Central. I think we're able to duplicate that model in other schools. I think that could help. Uh, I, uh, the Comitis Center, for those who are not familiar with the Comitis Center, right there on the um, Anschutz property, uh, they deal a lot with our unhoused, they do the sheltering, but they also have a mobile unit that go out. And if we're able to enhance the staff of that mobile unit to deal with mental health, being able to um, do a case file right then and there, as well as do a quick evaluation of physical health and begin to do a case file for these individuals, we may be able to assist those individuals as well. And then partnering with organizations like the Second Chance Center, um, Ready to Work right there on 225 in Parker, Providence at the Heights right there off of um, Alameda and Chambers. These are organizations that are working with people who have either been recently incarcerated or has been unhoused recently for whatever reason. They work with families as well as individuals. And how can we partner with them to make sure they have their health care needs? And last but not least, uh, when we do, if we ever was to do the school model, then we can begin to service families as well as the kids. And that's just one more thing families that are dealing with economic stress do not have to worry about and begin to focus on their careers and the kids can begin to focus on their education. And last but not least, and going to what um, Aisha was talking about, we cannot be afraid to talk about racism, white privilege. We can't be afraid to talk about um, air, environmental um, justice, economic justice. We have to have these conversations in the healthcare arena as well, because it is just as much impacted as other areas in the community. Thank you. I just want to piggyback on what Omar said, and I would say that um, what I'm very proud of for the city of Aurora and what I've seen is the amount of individuals who have put out a statement around Black Lives Matter. And I think that's a good first start. So there's a lot of things that you can be involved in, but I want to just really reemphasize to lead where you are. And so if you're on this call and your organization has not put forth a statement on Black Lives Matter, I encourage you mm -hmm. to take a leadership role on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not too late. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to encourage everyone to take a leadership role on Juneteenth, which is coming up this Friday. Uh, Juneteenth is a celebration of when the slaves, when black people, mm -hmm. actually African Americans, and at that time, um, Negroes, they weren't even called Negroes at that time, slaves, property, were told that they were free. And it was an odd of a, a year or maybe two years after when the bill had actually been signed. And that's why some people don't, some black people don't celebrate Fourth of July because they weren't free on that day. So if your organization has not talked about celebrating Juneteenth, I would encourage you to um, advocate for that on behalf and with your leadership. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, which goes with lead where you are, 
if you work with a black woman, if you work with a black man, if you work with someone who's biracial, if you work with someone who's Latino, if you work with someone who has not always been, who has never been extended equal opportunity and inclusion in America, reach out to them. Tell them that you stand in solidarity with them. It doesn't need to be public. It could be a text message. It could, you could slide into their DMs. Um, you could say it before a meeting starts. But let them know that you are with them, that you support them, that this, that this now is a difficult time, but it's been difficult. Um, and then the last thing that I would say is that plug in and support our local organizations that are run, ran by people of color. Um, and I've already mentioned a lot of those organize, organizations, so support them financially with your time, with your talent, with your resources, with an email. Support them and let them know that you stand. We are having a Juneteenth celebration in Aurora this Friday with a march uh, that will begin at 6 o'clock at the Martin Luther King Library. So we'd love for you to stand with us um, and, and, and participate. And if your organization has not had diversity training and is not, does not have a strategic framework for diversity and inclusion, I encourage you, I advocate for you to speak to your leadership to make sure that, that um, inclusion, diversity, and bias training is not a checkbox one and done but that it's a part of your overall values of what, of what your organization does um, for now and forever. Thank you. Are there any other questions, Joan? Um, so there's a lot of really good information being shared in the chat. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but I'm just gonna kind of, for those of you that may not be, have access to the chat, um, Colorado Access is accepting grant applications through June 22nd for innovative solutions to address health inequities and telehealth. Um, so that's one thing. Um, Colorado Medicaid is celebrating Juneteenth with an all staff meeting and a presentation by Blaine Harding. And then the Aurora branch of the NAACP has a health and wellness committee. If you want to get involved, please email Omar. Um, so there's some really good information in there. And I think that we can try and share everyone's email, um, maybe post meeting. We can try and do that, Mandy, um, yep. so that you can connect with our speakers going further. Um, well, I just uh, wanted to say that um, the Rural Health Alliance is going to be continuing this conversation in particular in, in all of our meetings, but um, in the social determinants of health group, um, we're focusing on race for the remainder of our 2020 meetings. The next meeting for that is listed on the slide. It's on August 11th. So we hope that those who are interested in it will join us for that. I just wanted to give an announcement. Um, I don't know how many people know that uh, Senator Fields has been meeting with all the, the major funders around race and equity and equitable recovery. And um, one of the things that happened from one of those meetings is the Colorado Trust has opened up a funding announcement around race. And uh, if there are individuals or organizations who are on this call who need help and training around race and you don't have the resources, um, there is a new funding opportunity that's available through the Colorado Trust to uh, train your staff, um, to to get um, minorities um, equipped with PPE um, and a lot of other great things. So please tune into that as well. Thank you. Mandy, I want to leave a couple of things. Um, if you yep. know any physicians of color that are uh, interested in leadership, the American Association for Physician Leadership is a great resource to develop your leadership skills as a physician. And also in August, the National Medical Association, which is a, a large organization of African-American doctors, I am doing a leadership program for them in August. So if you know any physicians of color 
that's a good resource that you can uh, log on to that. Uh, it's going to be a two-part segment in August I'm going to deliver for the NMA. Thank you. I might uh, follow up with you offline so we can share that in our next newsletter. Sure. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, this will be recorded again. So if you want to go back and rewatch anything or share it with any colleagues, it'll, it should be up next week. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks to our panelists too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.